Hello everyone, this is Kat and welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be starting a new Podfix series for the fic entitled The Mystery of Midori Izuku. Here's the summary. Over the course of one week, Midori Izuku sees his childhood friend turned bully, face consequences for his actions, gets appreciated for his skills, acquires a boyfriend that sits right in front of him, realizes that his grumpy homeroom teacher is actually on his side, and tells Aizawa Shota the truth about one for all. All that information, however, it's happening in the background. Follow our hero, Eraserhead, or Aizawa Shota. Over the course of the same week, Aizawa looks into his problem child and his many contradictions in order to not see Midori Izuku and Bakugo Katsuki paired together for their upcoming final exam. During this time, Aizawa learns things that he should have known from the start, talks to a lot of people, drinks so much hot chocolate, loves his husband, feeds his cat, gets a shocking six hours of sleep, reflects on his past, and learns the truth about a legend that was passed down through underground heroics for decades. This fic is 13 chapters, just over 56,000 words. I hope you guys enjoy. Here's chapter one. Chapter one, day one. There was something not right about Midori Izuku. Shota had had that thought several times during the first term with this particular problem child. He's always kept it in his head with varying tones of cadences as well. And yet, the fact of the matter remains, there was something off about Midori Izuku. The kid was a bundle of contradictions and anxieties that bounced off each other in increasingly baffling and complex ways. People are complicated. Shota knows this. Teenagers are especially complex because they're still trying to figure themselves out as a person. They're still trying to be a person, with their own thoughts and opinions and beliefs, no longer tethered to their parents or their childhood friends. It was a part of growing up and finding yourself, all of that coming-of-age shit. Granted, Shota's almost thirty-one, and he felt like most days he barely knew who he was, but he knew enough, so that was something. Either way, despite all this, there's something about Midoriya's massive contradiction, the way he struggles figuring himself out, that just appears off to Shota. It's something that he hasn't had a chance to dwell on too much during the course of the semester, but sometimes, usually after the kid broke a bone or did something particularly self-sacrificing, the thought would reappear. Midori has a powerful quirk, strong enough to rival All Might. Midori also flinches if someone tries to touch him from behind. Midori has the ideal virtues of a hero, kind, empathetic, compassionate, determined. Midori doesn't understand that losing his own life is not acceptable of an outcome. Midori smiles like nothing in the world has ever harmed him. Midori eyes him with suspicion and shrinks when Bakugo gets too rowdy. Human beings are illogical. Shota despairs and accepts the fact in equal measure. He watches Midori and comes up with more questions than answers. All of it concerns him at the end of the day, though. Usually, Shota would handle such things sooner. Given the class's penchant for surprise villain attacks, he's had to put it on the back burner. Right now, he wants to make sure that his kids live through the villain attacks before poking out their secrets. Of course, it all comes to a head while discussing pairings for the final exams with Nezu. Given everything the first-year hero course students at UA have faced so far, but especially 1A, they have to revise the exam. Teachers will act as villains for the students to fight against, testing their teamwork. The teams are chosen by him and Nezu, with approval from the panel of exam proctors. All very reasonable, very logical, Shota's just glad that they're not breaking out the goddamn robots again. The one-on-one -on -one meeting with Nezu is when the issue of Problem Child rears its complicated head. Bakugo and Midoriya? Shota asks as he looks over at the potential list that Nezu had put forward. Based on testimony of All Might and the others, along with the footage from the training exercise with the pair, the two have some sort of rivalry. It makes sense for the pair to work together. Bakugo especially would benefit from teamwork, from someone that he doesn't actively like. As you can attest, we do not get to choose who we work with in the field, Nezu says with a sip of his tea. Shota pauses at that to gather his thoughts. Bakugo and Midori have a history. Some of the class said that they are childhood friends. Granted, Shota didn't really have childhood friends that he grew up with, but... Well, but... Now that Nezu had labeled it a rivalry outright, actually said the word in reference to the pair, Shota's not sure if the word fits them or the label of childhood friends. He thinks of what he's witnessed of their interactions, how Midori attracts Bakugo's movements, and something in his gut says this isn't right. Shota believes in introducing his students to the unfairness of life. He believes in being direct with them. He believes in setting limits and boundaries. Shota also knows that his students are children. Sometimes, just sometimes, he wants to make things a little bit easier on them. He also thinks of Bakugo and Midori in that first exercise, Bakugo's gauntlets, and Midoriya barely getting out of the way in time. 
This isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't right. This is wrong. It settles in Shota's stomach like a lead weight. Arzawa, Nezu prods, looking at him with sharp eyes. Shota snaps back to life, knowing that he fell into his own head. Hisashi says that it's like watching a computer reboot or seeing someone turn into a living doll. Either way, he knows that he'll have to admit his thoughts to his boss. There's something about their dynamic that troubles me, Shota admits after a moment. Something about Midori has been bothering me for a while. I've been meaning to address it, but given the circumstances, I've been unable. The principal looks up with sharp, beady black eyes. He places his cup of tea back on the saucer and leans forward. Oh? I'd like to investigate it before we present the pairings to the other teachers. These kids have been through the ringers. Midori especially seems to be determined to put himself into an early grave. I don't want him to do so in an exam setting. Shota says it carefully. The last time he and Bakugo went against each other, that almost happened. I want to make sure that the exam can be as safe as possible for them. Nezu sits back at that. He looks thoughtful, but Shota gets nothing from his boss's facial expressions or tics. Nezu knows how to make himself unreadable. It's a skill that Shota envies and admires in equal measure, something that he's long since folded into his own personality. Only those closest to him really and truly know how to read him. Eventually, Nezu claps his paws together and smiles. We have a week until we present the pairings to the other members of the staff for approval, he says. You have until then to investigate what's bothering you, Aizawa. Otherwise, we'll present Bakugo and Midori as a team up against All Might to the staff. Shota nods at that, mentally feeling the countdown settle in the back of his head. With that topic handled, he turns back to the list. Now, as to the other pairings. Shota keeps an eye on Midori and Bakugo during their foundational heroics lesson that day. All Might is out due to an appointment with Recovery Girl and his doctor. Thankfully, it's a classroom lesson, so the potential for property damage and injury is at least 30%. Having one lung and barely a stomach, the man said wryly when he asked Shota and Khan to cover their homeroom lessons. I'm still amazed that I've lived this long. The gallows' humor of acceptance is something that would seem out of place with All Might. Shota likes it just fine on Yagi Toshinori, though. It makes him seem more real rather than a standard. So yes, All Might has the dubious honor of going to the doctors, most of anyone in the school, Midoriya included. The meeting with Nezu sits fresh in his mind. With it, the dichotomous issues that make up Midoriya remain at the forefront as he watches the kid lead his team, Kirishima, Sero, Todoroki, Hagekure, and Sato, through the strategy exercise. Rather than curl up in his sleeping bag and doze off, he stands, watching the classroom, walking around the, between the groups as well. It's good to change up their expectations, Shota tells himself. He hovers near Midoriya's group after listening over Yagirozu's. Minus the bone-breaking, even that's been let up on with his invention of his full cow technique, Midoriya excels in strategy. During these exercises, he and Yagirozu are the ones that people want to pick first. Given both of their issues with confidence, however, neither realize just why their classmates scramble for their plans. His group sits, listening to as Midoriya mutters to himself, working out a plan. It's clear that they're paying attention— now and then, someone will pipe up with a suggestion or a clarification on their quirk. Midori will jump a little bit when they speak, stutter out an apology, and usually one of his group members will tell them that it's fine. It's super manly how you know so much about quirks, Kirishima says excitedly. How'd you get so good? Oh, um, practice? I liked watching hero f fights a lot as a kid. C quirks, they're like a puzzle, you know? They're all so amazing. In, in my eyes, no quirk is less than that. Hagekore coos at that. Midori-chan, that's really sweet. The green-haired boy turns bright red at that. It, it's true, Midori insists, smiling at his team, one of those grins that makes the world seem kinder than it is. You all are going to be really great heroes one day. He then notices Shota watching them and jumps. He tenses and hunches in on himself a bit, like he's trying to make himself small, like he's scared of his teacher. Another thing that makes his gut twist unpleasantly. Um, but we need to do the exercise still, so, um, where was I? Todoroki glances at Shota for a moment, before moving a bit closer to Midoriya. It's a protective gesture, the underground hero realizes. Todoroki's trying to hide Midoriya away. You were saying something about me and Kirishima working together? R right! I, I was wondering, Kirishima-kun, if your skin can absorb heat, like stone when it's hardened— Shota wanders away, half listening to the other groups as they work out their plans and not talk about things other than the assignment at hand. He turns his attention to Bakugo's group, which is working less than coherently. Bakugo has improved since the start of the year, even if it's incrementally, but he still has difficulty working with others. 
Kaminari's attempting to play peacekeeper while Uraraka looks progressively more annoyed. Shoji watches stoically like it's some kind of tennis mat with some of his tentacles transformed into eyes as they move back and forth to track the argument. Shut up, round face. Bakugo growls at Uraraka. No! We're handling the rescue operations here for a mission, Bakugo. We can't just explode everything. We can't go in hot here. Uraraka wants to be a rescue hero. Shota remembers. He thinks that she'll be good at it, too. She has a good balance of taking no shit with that kind of kind and friendly disposition as well. Even if she has been focusing on her improving her own fighting technique, it's clear that she still has her eyes set on her goal. Across the room, Midori continues his muttering as his group works out their strategy for a villain apprehension that was assigned to them. He and Bakugo are as far apart as possible. The other groups of students are all in various states of discussion. Even so, Shota notices how Bakugo tracks Midoriya, and the tick in his jaw as Midoriya continues his habit with various inputs from his own group. Shota pinpoints the moment before Bakugo will explode, literally and figuratively, to tell Midoriya to shut up. Midoriya's judging by the tense back that he has, seems to almost sense as if something's about to happen. Shota, without thinking, finds himself stepping in front of Bakugo's line of sight of the other boy. Bakugo freezes for a split second. Shota gives him the usual even stare. The kid works his jaw for a moment, clearly trying to figure out if he can get away with a comment against Midori or not. Shota ticks his right eyebrow up, and that seems to tip the scales in Bakugo swallowing the brewing outburst and getting back to his group work. Shota glances over at Midori's group, but sees Todoroki looking at him. Todoroki gives him a single nod, though Shota can't detect the emotion behind it. He does, however, feel that he passed some sort of test with the red and white-haired boy. Again, the feeling of wrong settles in his instincts. He's brushed off Bakugo's outburst before, though the first day of class remains the exception. Now, a term in, Shota thinks that he should have done something sooner, but the feeling of wrong tugs at it, whispers in his ear as he settles back into the sleeping bag and keeps a half-opened eye on his students. Shota doesn't have any meetings after the school day finishes. Shinzo is currently sick with the stomach flu, based on the email that he got from his protege's cousin. He has unexpected free time now that he doesn't have to stay after for Shinzo's training to get him into the heroics course. Instead, Shota fills out the paperwork to get access to Midori's unrestricted file from Nezu. There are two tiers of filing for UA heroic students. One is their regular file, full of basic information such as their quirk, grades, a basic list of their past injuries, and any known conditions. It's what could not be used against the students, what's accessible via public information. It's kept on the school system and can be accessed by computers. The unrestricted file is on paper, goes into much more detail, needs permission from Nezu himself to be viewed, and cannot leave the special room on UA grounds. It's where the real dirt is, so to speak. Given the attack on the USJ and other assorted incidents that happened so far in the year, Shota really does applaud that sort of far-thinking paranoia. Given his and Nezu's conversation earlier in the day, he doesn't see why permission won't be granted. Looking over Midoriya's unrestricted file would probably answer more questions than not. After Shota completes the paperwork, he decides to take advantage of a few hours of silence by heading back to his and Hisashi's apartment for a nap and getting a head start on dinner. There's this thing. It's called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. Basically, it boils down to your mind playing a trick on you, because sometimes even your head likes to fuck with your perception of reality. In the end, you can't trust anything at times, not even yourself. Still, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon has more to do with the pattern recognition than anything else. Like when you think about a car that you've seen, and suddenly you see it everywhere you go. You're not haunted by the car or anything. Nope, your mind just is poised and ready to notice any blue car now that it's in your head. As far as Shota knew, this didn't really apply to people. Granted, he also wasn't an expert in cognitive functions of the brain, so really, what did he know? The reason he thinks of the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon is because, on his way home, he stumbles across Midoriya. Not that a student notices, too busy offering some comfort to a junior high kid. Shota, being an expert in stealth, moves closer, sticking to the shadows. You get more honest reactions when people don't know that you're there to begin with, he finds people are more genuine when he's not peering over their shoulders. When Midoriya has always been great with situational awareness, worryingly great now that Shota thinks about it, when Shota puts his best effort in, he's one of the best in the business in terms of being unnoticed. Won't report them to the school, he catches Midoriya saying to the kid. You want another tissue? I have plenty. I cry a lot. The boy sniffs and presumably takes the offered tissue. He mops up blood from his nose and scrubs his uniform sleeves against his eyes, mopping up the tears. Thanks for scaring them off, senpai. 
The UA uniform seems to put some fear of all might into most bullies, at least. Let me guess, they have some really strong quirks? Yeah, but really any quirk is better than... I get it, Midoriya says with a voice so full of understanding and resignation that it's like a slap in the face. Shota wants to know how that sentence would have ended. The other kid laughs, voice clogged by blood and tears and snot. Thought so, when I saw your shoes. Shota pauses at that. From where he's hidden, he sees that both Midori and the other boy are wearing the exact same red shoes. He wonders briefly what's so special about them that the other boy would think that Midori would understand. Maybe you should take tomorrow off, his student suggests to the other kid. Sometimes when it got too bad, I'd go to the bathroom and gag a bunch to make my mom think that I threw up. It usually got me off, or a migraine, easy to fake, won't make your parents worry, unless they'll get more upset if you're not in the next day. N no. It's a good idea, thanks. No problem. There's a support group I know, it's online, but maybe they would help? Wouldn't hurt. Aizawa sees Midoriya get one of his ever-present notebooks out from his backpack to scribble something down on a blank piece of paper for the kid. He rips it out easily, holds it out. The younger boy hesitates before taking it with bloodied, shaking fingers. Thanks, senpai. He sees Midoriya's head nod, curls springing with the movement. Be sure to get that blood out immediately, if you don't want your mom or your parents to find out about this. Yeah, I know the drill. Then, like ships passing in the night, Midori and the kids separate. The same red shoes scuff against the pavement. Shota stays in the shadows for several minutes with a racing mind. This is wrong. Something's wrong. This isn't right. His instincts scream at him. Over the years, he's learned to listen to them, especially when they're this loud and true. Something isn't right with Midoriya. Maybe it's never been right to begin with. Aizawa Shota was going to get to the bottom of it. All right, everyone. This concludes Chapter 1 of The Mystery of Midoriya Zuku. Chapter 2 will be next. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and let me know your thoughts and reactions below. As always, thank you so much for listening.